Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the GRIPS Forum. Uh, this is the second forum in the spring. My name is Izumi Ono. I teach international development policy here at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, GRIPS, based in Tokyo. I will be serving the moderator today. GRIPS Forum aims at informing policy debate by inviting leaders in various fields. It is a public event and at the same time gives our students opportunity to join and benefit the lectures and discussions. Today, I am very honored to invite His Excellency, Dr. Ibrahim Asane Mayaki, Chief Executive Officer, CEO of the African Union Development Agency, AUDA, NEPAT. NEPAT stands for New Partnership for African Development. Dr. Mayaki is an outstanding intellectual and policy leader committed to African development. He served as a prime minister of Niger during 1997 to 2000. And prior to that, he was minister in charge of African integration and cooperation and minister of foreign affairs. He also assumed various academic positions such as professor of public administration at universities in Niger and Venezuela, and also a guest professor at university in Paris 11 in France. Also, he chairs a number of research platforms. So building on his rich experiences, since 2009, Dr. Mayaki has been serving as a CEO of Auda Nepad, which coordinates and executes priority regional and continental project for African integration and also provides knowledge-based advisory support to AU member states and also related organizations. In this capacity, Dr. Mayaki has made a tremendous contribution to enhancing Africa-Japan partnership. This includes Africa Kaizen Initiative, which Auda Nepat and JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency, have been collaborating to promote Kaizen to various African countries. Uh, Kaizen, uh, many of you may know, is a Japanese approach to the continuous improvement of quality and productivity based on the participatory process at the factory floor. I would like to highlight that year 2022 is a very important occasion for Africa-Japan partnership because TICAT 8 will be held in late August, four months from now in Tunisia. This TICAT stands for Tokyo International Conference for African Development, is a pioneer high-level forum to discuss African development with African leaders. It was launched in 1993 by the Japanese government after the end of the Cold War, when aid fatigue was prevalent and also other partners as a disengaging in Africa. And this ticket is a multi-stakeholder forum co-hosted by United Nations, UNDP, World Bank, and African Union, AU. Over the past 30 years, many changes have taken place in Africa, including such opportunities as the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. At the same time, all the structural problems remain Furthermore, as you know, the world faces various shocks and crises right now. Therefore, it is extremely useful and timely to receive Dr. Mayaki's views on the prospects and challenges of African development and also the lessons learned from the partnership or cooperation with Japan to make our developmental engagement even more effective and fruitful. Personally, at the previous Ticket 7, three years ago, I had a great honor to participate in three seminars occasion with Dr. Mayaki. We discussed various issues such as African demographic changes, the need for job creation for youth and skill development, the importance of economic transformation, including broad-based industrial development and innovation and Kaizen. More recently, I had a great opportunity to work with a team of policy bridge tank of the Auda Nepad to share Japanese perspective of the development. So, well, let me stop here. So I cordially invite His Excellency Dr. Mayaki to speak. His title is Beyond ODA, how the cooperation between Japan and Africa can help rethink development. 
So he will probably talk about 30 to 40 minutes. Then we will have a panel discussion with a group, groups expert and students. And afterward, we will have open Q&A session with the wider audience. A presentation discussion in this session will be on the record. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ibrahim Mayaki. Mayaki-san, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Ono. It is really a, a pleasure uh, to be at GRIPS for, for this uh, conference. And let me uh, recognize uh, Professor Mishishita, the Vice President of GRIPS, and uh, greet all uh, the participants to, to, this, uh, to this conference. It's a personal honor. I, I feel honored to be here. And I hope that our discussions will be uh, very interesting on, uh, on this topic, which is beyond ODA, how the cooperation between Africa and Japan can help uh, rethink development. There are, I think, three key um, uh, words in, 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 in this title. Uh, the first one is ODA, beyond ODA. The second one is cooperation between Japan and Africa. And the third aspect is uh, rethinking development. So we will have to uh, um, discuss on what development means today. Uh, does it mean what it meant uh, when Truman, uh, uh, President Truman launched this concept uh, at the end of the Second World War? And uh, well, and uh, are the circumstances today um, equally uh, uh, um, uh, thought about in all the regions where you have low-income countries and uh, middle-income countries, let's say in, in, the, in, in the South. So uh, I will, uh, I have a PowerPoint with a few slides. Uh, on each one of the slides, I will spend some, some time. Let me maybe uh, close my camera here. And uh, uh, we, we can go to the, to the first slide, please. Okay, so I, I want to start by a, an historical contextualization. And uh, historical contextualizations are always important for me because they allow us to uh, really look at the present moment uh, in, a, in, a, in a continuity. Uh, uh, sometimes the understanding of the present moment uh, is uh, enhanced by the comprehension we have of the past. And uh, Africa's past is uh, quite uh, complicated. Other regions are complicated past, but this continent has a very peculiar uh, past, uh, which was heavily marked by colonization. And um, the, the first uh, aspect I, I want to highlight of this colonization without going deeply into historical facts is uh, uh, imposition versus integration. And for the last uh, 400 years, uh, uh, and including now in the last, uh, uh, let's say, uh, century, and uh, we have been most of the time as a continent uh, faced with the imposition of solutions uh, solutions to progress, solutions to, uh, let's say, development solutions uh, to most of the obstacles that uh, we were facing. And uh, the imposition of the solution was generally evidently coming from, from outside. So imposition of solutions is a key characteristic when we look at our our history. Uh, it has evidently started to change and we will have time to go through the changes that are happening. So we didn't uh, uh, go through an integration of solutions that could have been forged outside or that could have been reflected with external actors. And that uh, uh, um, imposition went against uh, uh, our capacity uh, to integrate. And if you look at the Japan history, which most of you know much better than I do, 
the integration of uh, external solutions in Japan history was marked by a link of these solutions to the cultural context of, of Japan, which allowed a, a, a progress where uh, there was much more uh, identification with a solution, at least cultural identification. This is important because it can allow to explain uh, the behavior of many of our elites and uh, in uh, the last 50 years and the behavior of our elites today. I'm talking about fundamentally political, political elites. Um, when we look at the history of the African Union, which was preceded, not just uh, the, I, I will ask when uh, when we can go to the to the next slide. Thank you very much. So I will stay on this slide. I stay on this slide. Thank you. So uh, when I will be ready for the second one, I will say next slide. So uh, this integrate this imposition uh, was uh, fundamentally uh, sustained by a rationale of mimetism, imitating uh, uh, behaviors, uh, generally uh, from the North. So we generally assume that uh, uh, strict imitation could uh, provide progress. Uh, but uh, strict imitation is not in favor of ownership of of the solutions uh, in every domain, uh, uh, technical domain, political domain, et cetera. So let me emphasize on this issue because it will allow us at the end uh, to question the concept of development that uh, we, uh, we are going to, to refer to. Uh, two words on the African Union. The African Union is currently the system that allows Africa to accelerate its integration. Before the African Union, we had the Organization of African Unity, and the main focus of the Organization of African Unity was to push for the liberation of colonized uh, countries, uh, like mostly in, uh, in Southern Africa. So when this decolonization process uh, ended, uh, we moved from the OAU to the AU, Organization of African Unity, to the African Union. And the focus of the African Union was the acceleration of integration. So development within the African Union systems is equal to accelerated uh, integration. And we think that by accelerating integration, we will be able to own our developmental solutions. Because the fundamental aspect, the obstacle to our development, as we see it, is fragmentation in 55 countries. Uh, the current geography of Africa, with this fragmentation in 55 countries, is the fundamental obstacle to its development. Because optimal solutions to development, whether it is in energy, in transport, in education, cannot be found at national level. Uh, in uh, small, tiny countries, small markets, uh, uh, whilst uh, culturally, uh, our spheres, our cultural spheres, are divided in several countries which are not really working together. So the role of the African Union is to accelerate integration in order to uh, tackle uh, the fragmentation in uh, which is the main obstacle that we are, we are facing. The more we are fragmented, the least we can develop, the less we can develop. So aiming at uh, uh, accelerated integration means uh, uh, breaking fragmentation. It means moving towards regional solutions. It means to accelerate integration. And it means to, to have a 
greater sense of ownership of the strategies that we implement. And uh, the aim of this is to reach in the next 20, 25 years, a fully integrated continent where the geography will be radically different from what it is today. And uh, if you look at what we promote as, for example, Auda Nepal as a development agency, a continental development agency, we work a lot on the issues of corridors. And we think that corridors will reshape the geography of a continent and allow much more uh, uh, owned solutions that uh, are going towards regional integration. Uh, next slide, please. Now, after this uh, historical contextualization, it's important to look at the contemporary issues. And I, I just took two of them. Uh, 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 excuse me for that, but I will just focus on two. I don't think we have time to go into, into more. And the first contemporary issue that I would like to flag has to do with uh, nation building. Uh, I spoke about fragmentation. And uh, uh, it is interesting to note that uh, at the independence in the 60s, our leaders were faced uh, with a, a, a schizophrenic attitude. I, I like to use this expression. Because at the same time, they had to build nations within artificial boundaries and reflect about how to integrate. And these two movements are evidently not the same. And this is why I talk about a schizophrenic attitude. But uh, the role of the regional and continental organizations allowed a better management of this schizophrenia and uh, uh, of this schizophrenic attitude. And we see today that uh, uh, with a principle of subsidiarity, which exists within the African Union, every issue uh, of conflict, every conflict related issue in a nation is taken on board by the regional entity and then supported by the continental entity, which means that by applying this subsidiarity principle, it allows us to uh, manage internally uh, uh, conflicts by bringing regional and continental solutions. And this is extremely important because it is shaping how Africa politically will be structured uh, uh, by strengthening regional blocks, which are tackling national issues. And these regional blocks are supported by uh, a continental block, which is the African Union. Now, at the national level, uh, what I would like to enhance with the two speed societies is that in this integration process, uh, the populations nationally are moving faster than the governments. And if you look at the movements of people, you look at the movement of ideas, you look at the movements of entrepreneurs within the continent, they are owning integration in a much faster way than governments are doing. So they, they are showing the way to the, to the African Union. So this two-speed society creates a, a gap between the delivery of uh, the governments on, uh, on development and the perception that the other actors, civil society, NGOs, uh, uh, private sector, the other operators, cultural groups have of integration. They, and uh, this is a, 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 a positive aspect because uh, whilst it is difficult for governments to auto-reform themselves, the strengthening of actors outside of a governmental sphere will have an impact on the way governments do transform, do reform, so that they are pushed towards a higher and a speedier uh, integration. It will be important, especially if we look at the transitions the, 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 our 
continent is going through. And uh, I will mention a few uh, transitions and go back to the concept of uh, two-speed societies. Uh, as you know, Africa will double its population between now and 2050, 2050 plus, and there will be about 2.3 or 4 billion inhabitants. And uh, we have not finalized our uh, demographic transition yet. Uh, and we have demographic growth rates which are still around between 3.8 and 4.2. And uh, this uh, uh, demographic uh, uh, transition is at the same time a challenge because as Professor Ono was mentioning, we need to create jobs, 20 million jobs per year in the next 20 years. But at the same time, it is an opportunity if we have the right strategies uh, to manage societies where the median age is 19. So, and managing societies where the median age is 19 uh, has challenges, but at the same time, it has opportunities because you have an energetic, youthful population uh, which can be open to speedy innovations. And uh, there we can see that education will play a fundamental role in order to tackle this demographic transition. The second transition we are going through is the uh, technological transitions. Uh, as you know, uh, you, you know the examples of mobile money in Kenya, which is uh, quite advanced, but it's not only in Kenya, it's in many other parts of the continent. It originated in Kenya, but it spread all over the continent. Uh, on 1 billion, 300 million inhabitants, we have more than 500 million uh, SIM cards today. Uh, and the, the role of the social media is considerable in shaping the type of uh, society we are in. And it allows a, 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 a better and freer expression of all the, uh, uh, the groups within a nation. Uh, and, it, and it is also a, a factor which reinforces the dimension of accountability at the governmental level. The third transition is the natural resources management transition. As you know, Africa is almost a, a net zero emitter of CO2, but we, uh, um, uh, are faced with uh, uh, the consequences of climate change, which has a direct impact on uh, uh, the quality of our land, our uh, agricultural productivity, and which is also a, a, a technological challenge because uh, we'll uh, need to move towards what uh, many experts call a green industrialization. But as you know, a green industrialization has not happened anywhere else in, in history, anywhere else in, in the world. So we, we have a, a challenge in terms of managing our natural resources, facing climate change impact, and moving towards what is called a green industrialization, because we don't want to repeat the errors that were made in the previous industrial revolutions and, uh, and transformation. And this is a, a, a challenge in terms of uh, uh, transition. Now, the last transition I would like to, uh, to mention is uh, the one related to human capital development and inequality. Uh, we are still, uh, and we are, one of the most unequal region in the world when you look at the Gini coefficients. And uh, uh, inequality uh, with a, very young population, uh, those uh, uh, um, make us face an issue in terms of governance. I will come back on this issue later, but it's important to mention the fact that as we move towards developing our human capital, we have to be very uh, focused on uh, uh, looking at inequality as a critical governance issue because inequality can have a consequence on the quality of our, of our uh, uh, governance uh, systems. Uh, next slide, please. Now, these uh, uh, 
contemporary issues, uh, these uh, development challenges uh, have led uh, Africa to, within the African Union, to think in terms of priorities. So our, on the global scene, when we enter into partnerships uh, with external uh, uh, parties, we need to be very clear about our priorities so that uh, uh, imposition does not happen again. Uh, and in being very clear in our priorities, it is important for us to defend our interests based on our priorities. And what has happened with the TCAD, um, the TCAD processes uh, fundamentally, is that uh, uh, the content of the TCAD processes have generally been a reflection on Africa's priorities. Uh, it is not embedded in an historical framework marked by colonization. It is much more open to other actors than governmental actors. It integrates, like uh, Professor Rono mentioned earlier, uh, uh, international organizations. So be, it has been more a process of uh, um, working together than a process of imposition. And this is why TCAD has been able to adapt, reform, and transform. And uh, we, since uh, the beginning, we have seen a, a, a shift in terms of the content and the priorities of TCAD, which have adapted, been adapted to Africa's priorities. And this is why, uh, since uh, 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 the, the TCAD of 2016 in Nairobi, you see a, a, an important role played by the private sector, Japan's private sector, Africa's private sector, in order to think uh, together in terms of regional integration, industrialization. We mentioned Kaizen earlier. And uh, so this is a, a, a common uh, discovery of our priorities so that TCAD can be reflective of our priorities. And the, the second aspect, which is important and which is assumed on the African side is, and which is also a characteristic of Japan's progresses, is the uh, 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 critical issue of uh, incremental changes. Uh, we are not thinking within these partnerships in terms of radical transformation or revolution, etc. cetera. Uh, because incremental changes allow to check what progresses have been made regularly on the one hand in terms of quality and effectiveness of implementation. Secondly, incremental changes allows to uh, foster a better participation of other actors than governments. And thirdly, uh, it allows to check accountability and to see what is the impact of the changes that are, that are being made. So we are of the opinion that incremental changes are fundamental for real changes. And if you look at uh, most of the uh, strategic frameworks that we have currently within uh, uh, the African Union, which are continental frameworks to which um, countries and regional blocks adapt. Uh, they are based on this uh, uh, rationale, incrementally changing. Whether it is in PIDA, which has to do with our infrastructure projects, program of infrastructure development in Africa, whether it is in CADEP, uh, agricultural transformation, whether it is on science and technology, we uh, uh, target incremental changes uh, through a delivery process of our regional integration agenda, where we translate at the regional level, the continental strategic frameworks, and we try to make sure that at national level, there is a coherence between the national plans and the regional strategies coming from the continental strategies. 
And the uh, importance of that in our discussion in terms of cooperation with Japan is that it has played a role on the, the dynamics of, of TCAD. I was mentioning earlier the question of corridors. Uh, corridors were fundamentally the product of a, 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 a rich discussion and interaction with Japan, and especially with, with JICA, on the basis of the experience that JICA had in, in Asia. So uh, you see, uh, ownership is present, uh, respect of Africa's priorities is, is present, and incremental change is uh, uh, the philosophy that drives uh, to real change. And we can see it in many of our strategic frameworks, and maybe we could go in the details of these frameworks from infrastructure to education, to transport, to energy in the Q&A session. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the expression rethinking development has been quite uh, uh, enhanced in the last uh, six, seven years. I, I've written an article on, on, on this. Uh, I remember when I did a conference at CIPA in Colombia and New York, uh, the main theme of my conference was on uh, rethinking development. And I always like to give the, the example of three uh, uh, Nobel Prizes in economics. Uh, and uh, I will make it short. Uh, I, I, I like to give the example of Douglas North, which uh, puts the focus on institutional development as a critical pathway to development, uh, on uh, Stiglitz, which puts the, uh, uh, a heavy accent on the issues of industrialization, uh, even if it has to reflect industrial strategies which have been uh, uh, um, uh, implemented elsewhere, notably in Asia. And I'd like to give also the example of Amartya Sen. And Amartya Sen, which is fundamentally, uh, freedom is critical. Uh, development of capabilities is critical. And if you want development in the long term, you need to empower your citizens, create the necessary capabilities at the level and uh, Amartya Sen says, in democratic societies, you do not have hunger. So uh, when you look at these three uh, um, uh, schools of thought by these three uh, Nobel uh, uh, prizes in economics, you can see the differences. There are evidently complementarities, but you can see the differences on the perception they have of development. Now, you look at uh, the current African context, and you see that this context is really marked uh, by a challenge in terms of demographic transition, as I was alluding to. And my conviction is that a society which has a median age of 19 years cannot be managed like a society which has a median age of 40 plus. Why? Because the bulk of the population, which is very young, wants immediate results. Uh, they are not waiting for 2063, 2050. They want immediate results. And uh, 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 this desire of immediate results needs to be taken into account in the way public policies are shaped. And this is why I insist on the concept of co-production of public policies, given uh, the demographic context in which we are. We can no longer function with uh, uh, governments centrally deciding what is good for the society. Uh, because uh, uh, the important bulk of young population in the society wants immediate results. So the best way to uh, uh, have a buy-in from this important size of a population which is young is to have them be part of the design of public policies. Once they are part of the design of public policies, 
They know what are the objectives and the results that can be obtained, and it can make them much less impatient than they are. So in terms of governance, it means that uh, uh, our governance systems uh, need not to reflect Western governance systems. We need institutional innovations that can allow a strong participation of the youth in the design and the implementation of policies in order not to face uh, challenges of, uh, uh, of uh, instability. Uh, some regions in the, in the continent are being stable. And fundamentally, when you look at the regions of conflicts, you will see that uh, uh, the, those who are part of uh, rebellion groups in conflicts are always very young. So it uh, shows you that uh, taking into account uh, the necessity to co-produce policies with the youth is extremely important for buy-in issues in order to construct a stable governance systems. The second point is that we have insisted a lot on the economic side of development and uh, you know, macroeconomic factors, uh, sectoral factors. Uh, uh, it is true that uh, uh, we, uh, we have neglected the territorial dimension of development, which is why now within our programs as a development agency, uh, we have uh, 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 themes which are directly linked to territorial development. If you look once again, let me give you an example of regions in conflict. Generally, uh, they have been these non-integrated non regions, abandoned regions, uh, abandoned regions with youthful population, and uh, a, a, a strong urbanization process with quite a good number of intermediary cities, which is a particularity of our urbanization, uh, makes uh, uh, creates a context where it is important that we think about development as a local issue fundamentally. And uh, for development to be a local issue, we need to focus on knowledge accumulation at the local level. Uh, uh, and knowledge accumulation at the local level is not only about education policies, it has to be there also about institutional, uh, uh, about technological innovation that can allow transfer of knowledge locally. So that a, a farmer in, uh, in Mali or Malawi or, uh, or, 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 or Tanzania in a rural area can uh, manage uh, its uh, solar panel, maintain it in order to have water, uh, 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 manage its irrigation process, check uh, uh, what are the prices of what is going to produce in the markets which are 15, 20, or 50 kilometers away and choose where he wants to go uh, to sell his products. So knowledge accumulation will be absolutely fundamental, especially at the local level. Lastly, long-term versus short-term solutions. I was referring to uh, the incremental changes. Uh, for incremental changes to happen, uh, you need a strategy which does not change every day. Uh, you need to co-produce that strategy with the actors which I've mentioned. And you need a long-term objective. And uh, it is within this long-term perspective that you construct short-term solutions and uh, uh, these short-term solutions have to be embedded in that long-term uh, uh, perspective. So let me mention the agenda that we have at the African Union level, which is Agenda 2063. It was designed in 2013 for 50 years. In its implementation, we have 10-year segments, uh, 2013, 2023 will, is the first segment. Uh, in a continuous manner, these segments 
and evaluate it so that we can see at national and regional level how the solutions which have been framed within this uh, continental agenda are being uh, implemented. So uh, long-term vision, but the short-term solutions are integrated inside the agenda. So it's not that uh, uh, we uh, uh, implement incrementally short-term solutions which are not embedded in a vision. That vision exists and it's called the, the Africa we want and it has clear priorities. And one of the fundamental priorities is the Continental Free Trade Agreement, uh, which many of our countries have ratified and which will allow Africa to have a, a, a common market. And uh, we, are, we, we have this long-term vision. There are issues to be solved in terms of short terms, issues of movement of people and goods, issues of rules of origins, issues of harmonization of regulation frameworks, but uh, incrementally within this long-term vision of having a common market, we proceed with these solutions. And uh, uh, it is important to mention that uh, going back to the two-speed society I was mentioning earlier, the private sector actors in the continents are the ones pushing for an acceleration of a, a free trade agreement that we have signed. So uh, you see that this long-term vision allows them as private sector actors to be part of a solution, uh, long-term solution, short-term solutions, and provide their feedbacks on the challenges that they are facing when they want to move from Nigeria to Kenya in order to implement a cement factory, for example. So uh, as we move towards the Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is the most important instrument that we have now, embedded in Agenda 2063, reflecting of the NEPAD values, which dates back to 2000, as we implement this fundamental instrument, we will move in incrementally towards a fully integrated uh, continent where we can have a, a, a single electricity market by linking the regional power pools, where we can have a single air transport market in order to take advantage of the, of the, of the, of the, of the rapid uh, increment that we see in our middle class, which is moving, even in terms of tourism, we are moving within, within the continent. So uh, the Continental Free Trade Agreement is a fundamental instrument that will accelerate uh, uh, the integration of this continent and allow us to move from imposition of solutions to integration, allow us to have a higher level of ownership change the geography of a continent by putting the accent on corridors, and then enter into partnerships that are mutually beneficial so that Africa can have a, a, a sound presence on the global scene. And mind you, in 2100, one out of four or five inhabitants on this planet will be African. So the way Africa transforms itself will have an impact on the global context. Arigato gozaimasu.